I think we can all agree this has been a really wonderful conference with loads of fantastic kind of positive, optimistic, forward-looking talks about all the fantastic things that we, we are going to be able to do with quantum computers over the next few years where we can uh, hope to outperform classical computers. So I thought you might fancy a change by this point in the, the conference. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is cases where we may have thought we could outperform classical computers uh, with our near-term quantum experiments. But, you know, perhaps surprisingly, it turns out that uh, the classical algorithms uh, were pretty efficient and, and could do a bit better uh, than maybe we'd thought. Um, so it's kind of, you know, slightly different perspective than many of the other talks. Um, so before I start, I would uh, like to begin with an advert for this thing uh, called the, the Quantum Software Manifesto. So um, I've been told that in the US, the only famous manifesto is the Communist Manifesto. And I can't promise this will be as influential as the Communist Manifesto. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, maybe it was going to be of, of interest to some of you. Uh, basically, this is a, a document which tries to promote the idea that uh, we should have you know, more research and more investment in uh, quantum software as distinct from quantum hardware. So you know, quantum algorithms, uh, understanding architectures, uh, verification of, uh, of quantum experiments, this kind of thing, um, in particular with a kind of European focus. But the idea is that um, anyone who, who agrees with it can endorse it, uh, which is you know, maybe helpful uh, those of us in, in the future who would like to see more, more activity in this area. Um, so I invite you to take a look at um, this, this page and just see if you'd like to endorse the quantum software manifesto. Um, so you can just you know, search for this if, if you're interested. OK. So what do I want to talk about today? So something which we've heard a lot about um, this week is um, this phrase, you know, quantum supremacy or quantum computational uh, supremacy. And this is obviously a kind of terrible word, uh, uh, supremacy, but um, I want to use it in, in this talk because I want to distinguish it from uh, advantage in the sense that we want to look at uh, quantum experiments which do something which we couldn't simulate on a classical computer in any kind of reasonable time. Like we might imagine a quantum experiment which we can do in one day, where if we had a supercomputer, um, it might take us a year to simulate that experiment. So, I want to, to talk about um, proposed uh, experiments which are extremely hard to simulate classically, rather than perhaps just achieving a, a fairly small advantage over classical computation. And but in, in, in fact, what I really want to talk about is some classical simulation algorithms for some of these proposed uh, quantum computational supremacy experiments. So classical algorithms which kind of show that we're not going to, uh, not going to achieve um, you know, quantum supremacy with these, these particular experiments, with these particular choices of parameters, let's say. And I want to talk about um, two examples of this in two different models. One is this model called IQP, Instantaneous Quantum Polynomial Time, which we heard a lot about um, earlier this week in Mick Bremner's talk and also in Jens Isaac's talk uh, yesterday. Um, and in that model, what the algorithm gives you is a polynomial time classical simulation of uh, of quantum circuits in this model, of sampling from quantum circuits in this model, if the circuits experience some kind of small amount of, of noise at the end of, of the computation. And there's also some technical constraints, which I'll, I'll talk about later. But the rough idea is that um, if we have some kind of you know, relatively realistic noise occurring in these, these circuits, then we get an efficient, relatively efficient classical simulation, um, which kind of contrasts with the, the hardness of classical simulation results, which uh, we heard about earlier this week. And the second result I want to talk about is in this somewhat different setting of, of boson sampling, which again we, we heard about earlier in the week. And um, this is a, just a kind of a numerical experimental result showing that classical algorithms for simulating these boson sampling experiments can be somehow surprisingly efficient in the sense that we can uh, simulate quite accurately experiments in this boson sampling picture, which are maybe a bit larger than we thought we could uh, simulate before. So this, this kind of pushes the, the threshold of, of quantum advantage or you know, quantum supremacy in this setting a, a bit further away than we thought uh, it was before. So yeah, so what I want to do is I'll start out by introducing these two models. I guess you know, we've already heard about them, but just to, to remind you and also to you know, introduce them in the way I want to talk about them later. Then I'll um, describe what the results are in each of these two, two settings. And then I'll uh, finally say a little bit about the, the proof or the, the algorithms uh, that, that go into these results. OK. So first, you know, what, what's IQP? We heard about this uh, already. Uh, so an IQP circuit, instantaneous quantum polynomial time, on n qubits, 
um, it looks like this. Uh, so we've got our, our own qubits uh, here. And the way the circuit looks is we start out with some Hadamard gates, one on every qubit. Then we have some uh, diagonal gates. So this, this thing here, this, this D, is just a circuit um, in the, the middle of uh, this, this overall circuit that's made up of gates like any other quantum circuit. But the key restriction is that these gates are all diagonal in the computational basis. So they might be like Z, control Z, uh, T gates, this, this kind of thing. Um, then we have Hadamard gates at the end, and then we measure each qubit in the computational basis. So uh, the result of this is some string of bits, some string of n bits. And depending on what the circuit is here in this, this D box, uh, this you know, gives us uh, different kind of distributions on, on outputs here. So for a given circuit, we get a different um, distribution on, on measurement outcomes, a distribution on, on n bit strings. Okay. And one nice thing about IQP circuits, um, apart from being perhaps easy to, to implement um, experimentally, is that these circuits have a nice mathematical description because IQP corresponds to sampling from some uh, Fourier transform of some particular function. So if we have the function f of x, which is equal to the exif diagonal entry of this matrix D, uh, so uh, yeah, f of x is just equal to, to uh, entry of, of D on the diagonal corresponding to, to x, bit string x, then the probability that we see a particular outcome s, so p of s, so s is an n bit string, the probability we see a particular outcome is given by this thing here, so it's um, an average over x of uh, minus one to the inner product of x and s over f, f2 um, times by f of x, all absolute value squared. Um, and this is just the, uh, the Fourier transform of the function f over z2 to the n. So you, know, you can just work out this expression based on you know, this, this circuit here. We've got, you know, because of these, these Hadamards on either side. And, and this is kind of nice because it means we can try and understand these IQP circuits in terms of um, Fourier analysis um, over Z2 to the end. So they're kind of mathematically kind of tractable. Um, and this model was introduced by uh, Mick uh, Bremner and Dan Shepard back in 2008. And already back in 2008, they had some cryptographic type arguments in their paper that it should be hard to simulate this model classically. By which I mean, it should be hard to simulate sampling from this output distribution here on, on n-bit strings. So, so they had some arguments for why this should be the case, but you know, these were kind of heuristic. Then uh, a couple of years later, in a joint work with Richard Joseph, who's also here, uh, they showed that these IQP circuits are actually hard to simulate classically if one's prepared to assume a computational complexity conjecture, namely that the polynomial hierarchy uh, doesn't collapse. You know, for those of you who are, who are not uh, complexity theorists and not familiar with this, this is kind of like a version of the, uh, the conjecture that P is not equal to NP, somehow a, a somewhat weaker version of this conjecture. Um, uh, and the, the result is that IQP circuits are, um, are hard to exactly simulate in the sense that if you believe the polynomial hierarchy doesn't, doesn't collapse, then it's hard to, for a classical algorithm to uh, exactly sample from this output distribution on, on n-bit strings. OK, so this, this is a very nice result, but it doesn't say so much about real experimental implementations because even the real quantum experiment isn't going to exactly sample from, from this distribution on n-bit strings. It's going to do it up to some level of, of approximation. And um, a few years later, uh, Mick and Dan and I were able to show that IQP circuits are, are still hard to simulate, even if um, we consider approximate simulators. So these are ones that, um, are, that approximately sample from the output distribution in the sense that the distribution that they sample from is within small total variation distance of the, the, the true distribution. So, so what this result rules out is classical simulators that sample from some distribution within total variation distance um, epsilon, where epsilon is some small constant you know, that's about 1% you know, or something like this. Um, so it rules out classical simulators um, that sample from something total variation distance epsilon from, from this true distribution, um, assuming you believe certain other computational con conje complexity conjectures. So, so I don't want to go into details about these, but they're kind of average case hardness conjectures, um, which uh, are kind of may, may, be, may be plausible, but probably very hard to prove, actually. Um, even, um, yes, yeah, so although we, um, this non-collapse of the polynomial hierarchy is a you know, long-standing conjecture, um, these ones are perhaps you know, less, less well-studied, maybe less easy to believe, but 
but perhaps um, still true. And you know, so, so this result says that, that these things are probably you know, hard to simulate classically, e even approximately. But somehow this is still not a very realistic result because this, uh, the, 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 the sort of regime that we're able to, to prove hardness for is that the total variation distance between the, the simulator and the real you know, distribution should be some small constant. And if you have like m gates in the circuit, that means that each, uh, like if, if you imagine a, the, you know, the quantum circuit uh, itself, like each gate, if, if that wants to achieve total variation distance epsilon, each of the m gates in the circuit needs to have like um, error about like epsilon divided by m, something like this. Because as we've heard earlier, these errors kind of add up. So, um, so if we have a kind of realistic experiment, like the kind of things we're, we're seeing you know, to today or in a few years' time, it's not so clear whether you can simulate the, whether these IQP circuits should still be hard to simulate classically. Um, and one reason I think this is interesting is, is not just because uh, we think people might implement these IQP circuits as a, as a nice experiment, but also because this, the same sort of arguments might end up translating across to other families of, of quantum computational supremacy type experiments. So, so IQP maybe allows us to kind of play around with this question and see you know, whether it provides us some intuition for, for other types of models. Um, so, so this was kind of a, an interesting open question. Um, and that, that's the one model I want to introduce. And the second one I want to talk about is boson sampling. And this is, um, as, as we've heard, is the problem of simulating uh, the behavior of n photons, uh, non-interacting photons, in a linear optical network on m modes. So we've got these you know, photons, like just two of them here, kind of being injected into some network of, of linear optical components, like beam splitters, phase shifters, this kind of stuff. And then at the end, we, we measure each of the modes and see you know, if we have a photon, or, or perhaps more than one photon in each mode. And this, again, gives us some distribution. So depending on what goes on in this linear optical network here, we get uh, different distributions on, on the output uh, modes. So, so the positions of the photons in, in the output. Um, so this also has this really nice mathematical description. So this, roughly speaking, corresponds to sampling from a particular distribution on subsets of uh, the integers between 1 and m. So this distribution, uh, P, is defined by um, the probability of seeing a particular subset, uh, S, of, of n, of size n, um, is the absolute value squared of the permanent of a submatrix uh, of, of A, uh, where the submatrix corresponds to the, the choice um, S, the choice of this subset. So, so S um, specifies a, a subset of the, the rows of a matrix A, and uh, so A is an n by n matrix, and uh, the, and it should also be a submatrix of, of a unitary matrix U, an m by m unitary matrix U, and then AS gives you an n by n submatrix of A corresponding to the the, the rows in the uh, indexed by the subset S, and then you know to, to find the probability of seeing that particular subset, we take the absolute value squared of the, the permanent of that submatrix, where the permanent, for those of you who haven't seen it, is like the determinant but without any signs, so it's um, a sum over all uh, permutations of uh, <coughs> of the integers between 1 and n, of the product of the entries of m given by a particular row uh, index i and a column index given by a permutation of uh, the i. And you know, the, the, the roughly part here corresponds to the fact that this only considers um, collision-free outcomes, where we only see at most one photon in each mode. And you know, th this is often a fairly good um, approximation. In particular, if we have a... Uh, yeah, a, a, a random unitary where m is much bigger than n, then, like, for example, m should be like, bigger than n squared or something like this, then we generally don't see collisions, so we don't have to worry too much about these other outcomes. Um, so so uh, we can sort of think of this as, as a rough approximation of the problem we're kind of trying to solve. It's just to, to sample from um, this distribution on, on subsets of size n of, of the integers between 1 and m. Okay, so, so this is somehow the mathematical task we want to solve. We're given the this matrix A, which is a submatrix of some unitary matrix U, and we're asked to sample from this distribution uh, P here. So, so that's like the mathematical task we want to solve. And it's kind of clear that there's a nice quantum experiment to do this. You, you know, you just implement the linear optical network and you do it and kind of automatically samples from this distribution. But then there's the interesting question of how well we can do this uh, classically. And um, Scott Aronson and Alex Arkhipov introduced this task in a you know, computational complexity sense back in 2010. 
and they had this extremely nice result that said that boson sampling is, is hard to approximately simulate classically if you assume various other conjectures in computational complexity theory. Um, like they also have an average case uh, hardness conjecture, which I, I don't want to go into. They also have a, a technical conjecture about anti-concentration, which I, I also don't want to go into. But anyway, th these are kind of plausible conjectures that one might, might try and believe. And their result is that um, this task is hard to solve um, for, for random unitary matrices uh, U, uh, ass assuming you believe uh, the, these conjectures, which I won't talk about. And where approximately simulate, again, means up to small total variation distance. So your classical simulator is supposed to be accurate up to total variation distance epsilon for some small constant epsilon. OK. But then you, know, you, can, see, you can maybe see already, because this, this is such a vague thing I've written here, um, this, this doesn't necessarily tell us that much about uh, how hard this is in practice. You know, th this, this is an asymptotic statement that says that we believe that, uh, if you assume these conjectures, that uh, the complexity of the best classical algorithm for this problem you know, should be exponential. But you know, how big does n, or perhaps also the number of modes m, need to be in order for this actually to be hard in practice? Which is a kind of important question, because people are trying to implement these experiments now. And it would be nice to know how, how big these experiments need to be before we, we really see a significant quantum uh, advantage. And there have been a number of different predictions about this. And interestingly, the, the predictions have been going down in, in terms of the believed complexity of, um, of this problem in the sense that the uh, original prediction of Aronson and Arkhipov is that if you have 20 to 30 photons, um, then this should be doing something which is very hard to do classically. It should be demonstrating you know, really challenging uh, behavior to simulate. Um, and more, more recently, some have even predicted um, that you might be able to get away with, with seven photons, and this being hard to do uh, classically. So you probably need a lot of modes for this to, to be the case. But nevertheless, you know, the prediction is you might be able to, to get away with as few as uh, seven photons. And you know, so, so this, this has been kind of evolving, this number. But um, so somehow it wasn't so clear uh, what, what the, the right answer should be, I would say, in terms of um, experimental difficulty. OK, so these are the, the two questions that I want to talk about today uh, for, about IQP and boson sampling. And so, so now I'll just say what our results are for, for these two settings. So the first is a, is a theoretical result, and the second is a, an experimental, you know, numerical result. Um, so, yeah, so the first result is about IQP. And we're going to assume that we have some IQP circuit, which is... Um, you know, it's, it's of the standard form of, of IQP, as we, we saw before. But now we're going to introduce some noise at the end of the circuit. This is going to be an incredibly simple noise model. Um, we're just going to have depolarizing noise on each qubit with, with noise rate epsilon. Um, so we do the IQP circuit as normal. And just before we measure, we do this um, depolarizing noise. Uh, so this isn't supposed to imply that this is really um, what we think the realistic noise is going to look like in, in these kind of circuits. but you know, it's a nice uh, model to play around with. It's, it's very simple, which maybe makes it easier to, to, to analyze. And, you know, it, it's nice in a way because it's somehow quite a classical looking notion of noise because we, because we have this depolarizing noise right before measuring, it's equivalent to flipping each output bit with um, some probability like epsilon over two. So it's equivalent to taking the standard IQP circuit, measuring, and then flipping each of the output bits with some small probability. Um, so, you know, th this maybe isn't a realistic noise model, but it's, it's kind of a noise model that, um, you know, our circuit should probably be able to cope with, because if we have a real circuit, it's probably going to be much more noisy than this. So, um, we, so if the circuit wants to be hard under really realistic notions of noise, probably it should uh, try and be hard under, under this notion of noise too. Okay, so what's our, our result for this, um, this setting? So, we're going to, if, if P is the output distribution, so this is the, the distribution we want to, to sample from, then we need this technical constraint that the sum over X of P of X squared, so the L2 norm of, the, of this distribution uh, squared, is at most um, alpha times by 2 to the minus N for some alpha, which we think of as being a, a small constant. Um, so, you know, the smallest this thing can possibly be is 2 to the minus N. So this is saying that this is, is not much bigger than, than it's as small as it can be. So, so this is some kind of... Um, we could call an anti-concentration kind of uh, requirement, it's saying that this distribution needs to be quite spread out. It's, it's not too concentrated in one place. OK, so, so the result that we have is that if we have this, uh, this condition, 
then we can sample from the output distribution classically. Um, so this is the, the noisy output distribution that we get, you know, the noisy output distribution. We can sample from this classically up to distance uh, delta, L1 distance delta, in time n to the order log alpha over delta divided by epsilon, um, which is, you know, it's, it's kind of a horrible looking complexity. But the point is that if alpha, delta, and epsilon are all order one, so the, um, yeah, so if these are all, you know, small perhaps, but if they're, if they're constants, then this, uh, this algorithm is, is polynomial time. I mean, you know, the polynomial is gonna be absolutely outrageous, like it might be, you know, n to the 100, n to the 1000, you know, something like this. But still, you know, it's not exponential time as, as n grows. Um, so this is saying that assuming you have the constraint that all these things are, are, are small, that then you're not gonna see an exponential uh, quantum speed up for this kind, of, uh, this kind of experiment because we have this polynomial time uh, classical uh, simulation. Okay, and, and this parameter alpha is, is, I guess, kind of the most interesting or, or controversial one. And the reason why it's kind of interesting to think about this regime of alpha being order, order one is that actually for the hardness proofs of our, our previous paper, we needed this to be the case. So, so in general, like for the, 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 case, the classes of IQP circuits where people have proven that they're hard to, to simulate up to some kind of conjectures, you generally have this kind of um, this anti-concentration you know, condition holding. So, so in many cases, alpha indeed is actually quite small. And in particular, al almost all IQP circuits, you can show quite, quite easily, have alpha being order one. So, so random circuits have this property that alpha is um, alpha's kind of small. Okay, so, so this is you know, kind of a negative result if you want to prove um, that, I, that IQP is a way of achieving this you know, quantum computational supremacy. But one interesting thing is that this classical simulability result, you can get around it um, very easily, it turns out, by using a classical error correcting code. So Mick already mentioned this um, in his talk earlier in the week. I'll say a little bit more about it. But the basic idea, or the intuition here somehow, is that the noise at the end of the circuit is, is kind of classical. So maybe it's not surprising that we can just use classical error correction to deal with it. We don't need to use um, full quantum fault tolerance. Okay. So, and, you know, if, so, so in case uh, you're already wondering about, you know, if there's, there's some kind of contradiction here that if we uh, encode with this classical error correcting code, you know, don't, don't, you know, why can't we just classically simulate that new thing that we've got that's, um, that's still an IQP circuit? Well, the, the point is that this alpha parameter here kind of uh, blows up then when you, when you do this. So, you, um, so this isn't in conflict with, with that result. Okay, so that's the IQP results. And next, just to talk about the, the boson sampling results. Um, here here we, ha we don't have anything theoretical um, in, in our paper, but we do have something kind of empirical to say, which is that with a simple classical algorithm called uh, metropolized independent sampling, which probably goes back to the 50s of, at least, um, this algorithm uh, can sample from this boson sampling distribution with, quote, good accuracy by computing um, order one n by n matrix permanence. Um, so what does good mean? Well, it means that, um, firstly, you can look at it, it looks pretty good, but also that if you can do some statistical tests, uh, then they, they pass and, you know, it, it looks like we're achieving good accuracy, but, you know, this is an empirical result. We don't have a proof that uh, this, is, um, this is achieving this, but, you know, it, it looks pretty good. And, you know, what's this order one here mean? Well, it means that um, in practice, it seems that you can get away with computing something like 100 matrix permanence per, per sample. Um, and this gives you fairly good, good accuracy at approximate, uh, approximately simulating this boson sampling distribution. Okay, so, so why is this interesting to kind of cut down the number of matrix permanents that you, you need to compute to this relatively small number? Well, the reason is that each uh, matrix permanent of an n by n matrix can be computed in n times two to the n time, or thereabouts, uh, by an algorithm called Rice's algorithm. Um, and you know, this is still exponential, uh, like obviously, you know, 2 to the n is, is exponential, but it's, you know, not that bad an exponential. So, so if we look at the entire distribution, the entire boson sampling distribution, it's a distribution on m choose n things. And if m is something like n squared, you know, this is something like n to the 2n or something like this uh, in size. So computing the, the whole distribution would take substantially longer than, than 2 to the n time just to write down all of the, the elements. So, so this is somehow a lot less than this. Um, and then perhaps more importantly is, you know, forgetting these kind of weird big O's here, uh, the, the, uh, the actual, you know, practical results are that you can achieve quite good accuracy for 
n equals 20 easily on a laptop, by which I mean, you know, in uh, perhaps a second, uh, you can get, um, you know, a, a few, quite a few samples, something like this, maybe, you know, 10 samples, 100 samples. You can get um, good accuracy for n equals 30 on a fast uh, server, like a, you know, sort of a fast um, computer you might um, have in your, your office. And uh, we project that you might achieve uh, good accuracy uh, for n equals 50 on a supercomputer, though, you know, we didn't run it on a supercomputer. This is based on other people's results about how long it takes to compute permanence on a, on a supercomputer. So, so what I mean by this is, just to, to reiterate, is that, you know, you could achieve pretty good accuracy what, and fairly frequent samples. So each, you might get each sample in like uh, a second or something like this. Okay. And um, as well as this, there's uh, another paper by um, Peter Clifford and Raphael Clifford uh, at about the same time, which showed that there's even a provably correct algorithm for exact boson sampling, which had achieved similar performance. Um, so if you don't believe you know, these um, numerical results, then actually there's a, a proven theoretical result that you can achieve, um, you can uh, solve boson sampling problem in time, like n, order n times by two, 2 to the n time. So, um, so, so this shows that this somehow really is the, the true complexity of, of the boson sampling problem. Um, and I guess the, the conclusion from this is that demonstrating uh, quantum supremacy using boson sampling might be a bit more challenging than we thought previously. In particular, you're not going to do it with n equals 7. Um, you, yeah, I'll, I'll show a bit later on a, a plot for where we think you, know, you might need to be to, to achieve um, some kind of significant advantage over classical computers. But you, know, but you can definitely do it for n equals um, uh, 20 or 30 you know, on your own computer without too much pain. So. OK, so, so that's the results. For the last few minutes, I want to say a bit about the you know, the proofs or the, the algorithms or, you know, how these things work. And I'm going to start with the, the IQP result, which, remember, was about um, approximately sampling from the, the noisy output probability distribution of these circuits. And the proof, um, I mean, as, as I said, you know, IQP has this nice property that you can uh, understand it in terms of Fourier analysis. And uh, indeed, the proof will be based on, on using Fourier analysis over Z2 to the N and applying this to the, the noisy probability distribution um, on outputs. Um, so I'm going to call that uh, P tilde now on this slide. OK. So, so the basic idea is to use a, a kind of beautiful feature of this um, depolarizing noise, which is that if we look at the Fourier transform of this function P tilde, so remember this is a, you know, P, P tilde S is a you know, probability of seeing a particular n-bit string S. So this is now the, the Fourier transform of this function over the group Z2 to the n. And the, the nice thing about this depolarizing noise is that it behaves very nicely with respect to this um, Fourier transform in that it shrinks the high order Fourier coefficients of this, uh, uh, yeah, I guess this should, yeah, this should be P tilde here. Uh, oh, no, sorry, no, this should be P indeed here. So, th so if we have a um, you know, Fourier coefficient corresponding to S, then, and if we have noise with rate epsilon, then this Fourier coefficient shrinks by an, um, 1 minus epsilon to the Hamming weight of, of S. So where the, when the Hamming weight is large, this kind of goes down very, very quickly. Um, and the, the kind of intuition for this is that you know, the high, high, Fourier, high order Fourier coefficients, the ones with large Hamming weight, they kind of correspond to the, you know, this kind of spiky or you know, quickly oscillating you know, parts of, of this function uh, P. So these are the bits that really get suppressed by, by noise somehow. I don't know how good, good that intuition is, but at least that's you know, my intuition. So, so the point is that if we look at the Fourier expansion of this function p, then we only need to understand the low order parts of it in order to approximate the, uh, the noisy di uh, distribution p tilde well, because the high order parts just get killed off. And it turns out that it's sufficient to approximate p uh, Fourier coefficients p hat s for all s such that the Hamming weight of s is at most log alpha over delta divided by epsilon. So, you know, I, I won't... Um, Go, go through the proof, but um, you know you, you can you know churn, churn through some uh, some equations, and, and this is what you get that if you have a good approximation of these things um, uh, p hat s for all s with Hamming weight at most this, that, then you get a good overall approximation of the, the probability distribution. There, there are definitely some things swept under the rug there, but that's the, the basic idea. Um, and then the question is, you know, how do we actually approximate these, these coefficients? So I should say, like, up to this point, 
uh, the, there's nothing about this argument that depends on the circuit being an IQP circuit. This holds for any quantum circuit that we can look at the output uh, probability distribution and if it experiences noise, then the high order parts get suppressed. But, the, but then the question is, you know, can we actually compute these, these Fourier coefficients of this, uh, this output distribution? And in the case of IQP circuits, it turns out that we can. We can use some kind of um, Fourier inversion argument to say that, you know, that each coefficient p hat s actually has a nice interpretation in terms of some convolution of this function f, which remember was you know, the diagonal entries of the, the matrix D in the middle of the circuit. Each, um, each coefficient is given by a convolution of this, uh, this function f uh, you know, with, with itself. And this thing we can approximate efficiently just by sampling different values um, of f. So if we want to uh, approximate this thing up to you know, a suitable level of error, we can just um, sample a few choices, y at random, take the average, and then this thing is, gives us a, a fairly good approximation of, of p hat s. So, so we can do this for all of the, uh, the coefficients corresponding to strings s of Hamming weight at most this, and there are like n to the order log alpha over delta divided by epsilon of, of these things. So the time we need to do this is you know, n to the order this, this thing here. So, you know, like I said, this, this is kind of horrible, but it's still polynomial time uh, when these things are all, all constants. Okay. So I should also mention some subsequent work about this. Uh, so that there's a, a very nice paper by Jung and Gao, which showed that you can actually apply this algorithm um, and, you know, some extensions thereof uh, to simulate noisy, random, non-commuting quantum circuits. So, so general quantum circuits rather than just IQP ones. And this is a very nice result. There are some kind of caveats about it. Uh, so their analysis doesn't give you something that works for, for, most, for, for all circuits. It gives you something that kind of works for most circuits. So, so what you get from their result is that for, um, you, know, that you, you get an algorithm which you can run, and for most circuits it will be good, but for some circuits it, it won't necessarily be good. It won't give you a good approximation. But um, it was shown by um, Sergio Boixo and co-authors um, a little bit later that, in fact, for, for random quantum circuits, the Fourier coefficients of the, uh, the output probability distribution, they decay so fast that, in fact, even um, guessing that the uniform distribution is, uh, e even you know, having a classical approximation of just sampling from the uniform distribution, this even gives you a better simulation than, than this algorithm, than the Jung-Gao you know, use of our algorithm. Um, and you, know, you can also apply this uh, sort of analysis to random IQP circuits as well. Um, so you know, one way of interpreting this is you know, good news for random quantum circuits and, and random IQP circuits that you can't use, um, you can't use this algorithm. The other is, you know, interpretation is, it's, you know, is, is bad news because it shows that even just the uniform distribution is, is a kind of good simulation in this kind of regime. So yeah, I guess it, it kind of depends on your, your perspective. Um, but you know, another interesting point about this is that, as I mentioned before, that you can actually deal with this notion of noise uh, quite easily using classical error correction. Um, so this allows us to get um, a hardness result even when you have IQP circuits that have this kind of noise happening at the end. And I'll just say very briefly, uh, Mick already said this, but just to say very briefly how this um, classical error correction idea works. If we have an IQP circuit, then the diagonal part of it, D, we can write it as, as something like this. So D is um, e to the i uh, h, where for some Hamiltonian h, where h is given by sum over L terms of some, some weight times by some uh, tensor, uh, well, yeah, some tensor product of, of Z gates acting on different qubits. Um, so a way of thinking of this um, is that the circuit itself is specified by some matrix of zeros and ones that tell you, you know, for each term, which qubits there are, there are Zs on. Like, because um, maybe we can assume that these, these theta j's are all constants, actually. It doesn't really matter, but, um, you know, but the key part specifying the circuits is just this matrix of zeros and ones, um, C, that just tells you which, uh, which qubits have, have a Z gate on them. And what we can do if we want to, to correct this um, sort of noise classically is we can just, uh, you know, do maybe perhaps an obvious thing, which is apply a classical error correcting code to this matrix C. So we replace um, C with a matrix CM, where M is a generator matrix of some classical error correcting code. So we just you know, multiply this matrix by the generator matrix of a code. And you can show that this means that the, the output bit strings of the resulting kind of encoded uh, IQP circuit, 
they have a nice relation to, to the original ones in terms of this code, in that the each um, uh, so, right, so, so each uh, diagonal entry of, the, uh, of this uh, matrix, that we, this new, new one we get, D, dm here, is equal to uh, this, what we had before you know, with, uh, with matrix D, but we've replaced x with, with m times by x. So, so each of these bit strings gets replaced with its encoded version um, some, somehow. Um, so th then you, know, you can also show that when you, see, when you look at the outputs, uh, output distribution of this encoded IQP circuit, um, then if you didn't have any noise, you would get something that's like a, a distribution on encoded bit strings. So rather than the original bit strings that, that you had a distribution on those, you get a distribution on encodings of them. And then when you have noise happening, this just corresponds to bits of these encodings being flipped. Um, so this means that you can use your classical error correction algorithm that corresponds to this code just to correct these errors and to go back to the, uh, to the original bit strings that you had. So this means that you can, you can kind of undo this, this noise at the end of the, the circuit. And the nice thing about this is that we have very good classical error correcting codes whose overheads are very low. So this means that, that th this kind of noise here happening at the end um, can be dealt with kind of quite easily without very big overheads. Um, OK, so that's the rough idea. And just to mention the, the algorithm in the boson sampling setting as well, um, so as I said, this uses a technique called uh, metropolized independent sampling, MIS. Um, and just to you know, introduce this briefly, basically the, the idea behind this algorithm is that we have a distribution which we can sample from efficiently, and we want to go from this to a distribution that we, we can't sample from efficiently. Um, so the distribution that we can sample from efficiently is the distribution on so-called distinguishable bosons. Um, so this is, is a nice trick that if you start out with um, this matrix uh, A, which remember I said is a um, submatrix of, of a unitary matrix, and you form a new matrix by taking the absolute value squares of each entry, that's what this notation here is supposed to, to mean, then if we have the same kind of um, distribution where now we, you know, the probability of seeing a particular subset of um, the rows is given by the permanent uh, of you know, that's, uh, that submatrix of, of A, only we've now got you know, the absolute value squared on the, on the entries rather than on the outside. Now, if we look at the problem of sampling from, from this distribution, you can do it efficiently classically. And it's kind of a, a nice exercise to, to see how to do this. Um, it's also, you know, it's an appendix of a paper by Aronson and Arkhipov. They describe explicitly how you can do this. But the kind of intuition is that nothing kind of really quantum somehow goes on now because uh, these things are just behaving like kind of classical particles. Like, um, so you can kind of treat each one of them as separately. So, so this thing we can sample from efficiently. And what we want to sample from is something that looks kind of similar, which is this, this boson sampling distribution, which is the one you know, which we can call it the distribution on indistinguishable bosons, where you know, we now have the absolute value squared on, on the outside, like I, I showed before. And you know, we, we sort of got access to this distribution D, and we want to get to distribution I. And I can describe the algorithm for doing this in, in basically one line. Um, which is that we start out by taking a sample from this distribution D, the one on um, distinguishable bosons, and then we repeat this, this process where we take um, new samples uh, from this distinguishable uh, boson distribution D, and we accept them with a certain probability that's given by, by this thing here. So this is, uh, yeah, if you ignore this, this min here, this is basically a, a ratio of probabilities under this indistinguishable boson distribution. Then there's another ratio of probabilities under the distinguishable boson distribution. Um, so you, could, you can show that if you repeat this procedure you know, again and again, that you, know, you take samples from uh, you know, this uh, distribution D and you, know, you accept them with this probability. And you know, if you accept, then you keep this as your new sample and then you go on and you repeat and repeat. Um, you can show that this will eventually converge to sampling from the distribution um, I. So it, it will eventually converge to sampling from the, um, the uh, true you know, boson sampling distribution. Um, and th this is a, a really simple example of a, a Markov chain Monte Carlo method. It's kind of the most simple one you could possibly come up with, I guess. Um, and then obviously the interesting question is, you know, how, how long does it take to do this? Um, and empirically, it seems like it doesn't take so long. You know, you, you have to, you, you can't just, um, well, okay, so there's a few things you have to have to consider to figure out how long this will take. Firstly, it's, you know, how big is this acceptance probability? Like, what, what is these, you know, what are these ratios here? Like, how big are they? 
And it turns out that, uh, in general, uh, it's, you know, in our experiments, it seems to be quite large. The exceptions probability is pretty big. Um, next question is, you know, how many samples do you need to take before you seem to be you know, converging quite well? And the answer seems to be you know, about 100 or something like that. You know, this is just an empirical, empirical result. We don't have any, any proof. Um, but you, know, you, you can kind of even look um, in pictures to get a sense for, for how well this algorithm works. Um, there, there is some stats as well, which I'll you know, spare you from, you know, it's in the paper. But um, you can see, for example, in the case where n equals 7, so this is just 7 photons, that this is a nice case because we can compare like, various different uh, sampling methods, including brute force sampling. This is kind of as big as, uh, a size as brute force sampling can go. And a, a way that you can compare these different uh, sampling methods is you can look at uh, some particular statistic of, of the output. Like here, we're just looking at you know, the actual probabilities. So the uh, absolute value of the permanent squares, then you know, to make it look nice, they're taking like minus log of it. But um, we can have the histograms of these different, um, uh, of, the prob of the probability distributions we see under these different methods and see what they look like. And you can see that this distinguishable distribution looks quite different to the others. But these other ones, um, the uh, metropol metropolized independent sampling, brute force sampling, and also rejection sampling, which I guess I, I won't talk about today, these things all um, seem to do very well. They all seem to sample from, from the right thing. And indeed, it turns out for, for larger n as well, you, you can uh, see similar plots, and you can see that, that um, this does quite well. OK, so, so based on this algorithm, we can make some predictions of where we need to be in order to see you know, quantum supremacy using boson sampling. And there's, you know, there's no rigorous definition of what quantum supremacy might mean. But we can say, for example, you know, a couple of definitions. For example, the, the classical runtime, TC, on a supercomputer, maybe that should be 10 to the 10 times the quantum runtime. You know, that's, that's one possible criterion. Or we might say that the quantum runtime should be at most um, a week. The classical runtime should be at most 100, it should be at least 100 years, you know, this, this kind of thing. Um, and you know, we can make educated guesses for parameters for the, the quantum experiments and you know, how long it will take to, to get these samples on a supercomputer to try and figure out where the boundary is of, of quantum supremacy. So, so what this, this plot is showing is the number of photons along one axis and then the, the transmission probability of, of given photons. So that's the probability that a photon survives to the other end of, of the circuit. So because any, any real circuit is going to have loss and, and so forth. So, um, so, so what you know, we're able to, to infer is that you've got this curve here of, of QA bigger than zero. So this is the region where there's any quantum advantage over this algorithm that we presented. Um, the dotted lines are if we allow a certain amount of loss in the experiment, which I won't go into. And we can see like these points here are the, uh, the parameters achieved by experiments that we have now. Th this one A here is kind of interesting. This is a, a proposed experiment from Jamwe Pan's group, but you know, it's not an experiment we have now. Like These are the experiments that, that we have now, and they're kind of down in this, in this region. And in order to achieve you know, quantum supremacy according to these criteria based on our you know, educated guesses, you kind of need to be up here. So you probably need you know, around 50 photons and transmission probability of you know, well over a half for each, each photon. So, you know, depending on your point of view, this could either be very challenging or, you know, maybe not so challenging. I don't know. Um, okay, so, so the overall message, I guess, of the talk is that quantum supremacy, so-called, might be kind of hard to, to achieve than we thought if we have to deal with realistic errors and also, you know, non-trivial classical algorithms that, that um, you know, if, if we think a bit harder about what the classical algorithms can do, then they might be able to outperform, you know, uh, the quantum experiments. But a nice thing about the errors is that we might be able to deal with them using simpler error correction techniques than full quantum fault tolerance. And you know, we heard a lot about um, error mitigation earlier in the week, which is perhaps the kind of physics perspective on this. And this is somehow perhaps the computer science perspective that if you have a kind of very classically tractable error, maybe it's kind of easier to, to deal with um, than, a, than you know, a full, fully full-blown quantum kind of error. So I'd like to finish just with some references. So the work on IQP was joint work with Mick Bremner and, and Dan Shepard is in quantum. The work on boson sampling is joint work with many people uh, and it's in uh, nature physics. And also there's a survey on quantum computational supremacy with Aram Harrow that you might find interesting too. So that's everything I wanted to say. So thank you all very much. All right, we have time for a few questions here. Hi. Uh, hi. Thanks. Thanks, Ashley, for the great talk. Um, I thought that um, the the algorithm for um, IQP with with small amount of errors was pretty cool. But do you mind just showing the the result for the 
um, scaling, like you had the oh, yeah. theorem there. I just wanted yeah, to yeah, yeah. Um, make a comment about the notion of simulation used there. Um, uh, so one. it was, yeah, yeah, that one. So it's like n order. Um, yep. um, so I just wanted to comment that like, uh, uh, you know, it makes sense that when you fix this kind of delta, the L1 distance, you get something that scales polynomially, but um, maybe a, a more, uh, a kind of better notion of simulation would be one where you're polynomial in both n and in one on delta. And we, we've got a paper coming up next week where we kind of show that this is what you need in order to have a referee not be able to distinguish between the simulator and, and the actual system being simulated. So potentially there's like a gap there where you, you've got a simulator, but uh, somehow the system can do computationally more interesting tasks than the simulator can. So I just wanted to point that out. And you know, I wonder if this like um, move where you kind of do impose a classical code on top of on top of this and then recover the complexity only happens when you have this notion of simulation, but not the stronger one. I, I don't know if you have any. Okay, on that. I mean, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> I just say, um, yeah, I guess I, I don't. Yeah, I don't have um, too many insights into to kind of what these parameters should somehow really be, or if it, you know, if you look at other notions of simulation. I mean, obviously, as you say, L1 distance is, is maybe not the perfect one. It's just, you know, one which is kind of tra tractable. So, so yeah, I think that's, that sounds very interesting. But yeah, nothing further to, to add. Ashley, yes. on, on the same slide, uh, Sorry? Do, you know, do you know what is the constant in the exponent? Oh, this one. What is the old, yeah, do you have an idea of the constant? Uh, I could, yeah, you could work it out. Um, it's, it's not outrageous, I don't think, but it's, it's not very good either. <laughs> Uh, so, like, for instance, if you use one of these, like, four nine uh, superpolar cubic computers, if there is anything expected to have, would this give some practical number, or, or if you possibly can have superpolar you can get that out? Well, I, th I think, like, the results, I guess I, guess I mentioned of, um, you know, th this, this other work of um, Sergio Boxo and co-authors kind of suggests that if you want to do a random circuit on these, uh, this sort of architecture, then you're probably better off just simulating it with a uniform distribution. Like, uh, well, okay, so yes, yeah, so so you could. Um, yeah, so so. Uh, well, yeah, okay, so I, I think well, maybe Sergio can correct me, but I, I think like they just looked at kind of arbitrary constant epsilon uh, somehow. Uh, and, and, you know, this is, I mean, it's backed up by some theoretical results, but, it's, you know, there are numerical results here, here as well, so I don't know, uh, yeah, precisely what that is. But, but yeah, I mean, like, the, the constant, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I might guess, like, 10 or something, but, like, I, yeah, I, I don't really know. And, and the, you know, for, for what the epsilon really is, like, you know, if, if it's, um, you know, 0 0.01 or something already, this is not looking so good in terms of a, a classical simulation. I mean, you've already got, like, n to the 100 before you even worry about these other parameters here, so... So I'm not sure this really gives you a realistic simulation. Okay, let's, uh, let's, we'll take it afterwards just to get a break. Yeah. So uh, let's thank uh, Ashley. Uh, cool.